Anyway, uh, like I said today, uh, mostly we'll be talking about the background of ancient China. I'll kind of go into some geography first. Talk about the Yellow River Basin, all that, I guess, first. And I'll get into some of the early dynasties of China. I will talk about philosophy today, too. We mostly talk about Confucianism, which is probably one of the most famous philosophies that came out of China. Uh, but anyway, let me know if you have any questions, comments during this lecture, or if not, you can, like I said, you can post comments, questions, you know, this week or next week, whenever you want, of course, on this lecture or also previous lectures as well. So anyway, um, of course, I do have a PowerPoint lecture I have developed, of course, for ancient China, which we'll be using uh, this week. Uh, so um, mostly I will first talk about geography, a little bit uh, about ancient China. Uh, not just like the important rivers and all that, but just the region around China, which uh, ancient China developed uh, in um, East Asia. Now it'd be about where it was. Uh, and um, we've pretty much talking about, we've talked already about all the early civilizations. Uh, China's the last one, of course, we're getting to, because we'll be moving on, you know, talk about like Europe mostly, Greece and the Romans, I think is the next thing we've got coming up next after China. Uh, and uh, so China, China is the third oldest of the civil, of the river valley civilizations because uh, you had like Mesopotamia and India and then Egypt's older than China. And um, so it developed in East Asia, like I said, uh, it's based around what is the Yellow River Valley, uh, which uh, I can show you kind of a map of where it is. It's um, kind of located Mostly China developed uh, predominantly between like um, central China here and the East China Sea here. So like basically about right here is about where ancient China first started. That area you're looking at where I'm circling around is often called the, um, they call it the uh, East, they call it the um, North China Plain is what people dub it, which I just had that up there a second ago. Yeah, North China Plain. It's an area that's kind of between the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, and uh, it's a very fertile plain area, Eastern Asia. It's where they started growing crops, like during Neolithic times. Uh, and so from there, you have all these different dynasties that would emerge there. You know, a lot of their cities were built there uh, as well. And uh, China developed early on into like kingdoms, ruled by kings, uh, like you see like in other places. And, um, of course, the Yellow River is one of several famous rivers in Asia that are well known. Uh, the two most famous are probably the Yangtze and the Yellow River, which are the two longest uh, overall. Uh, the Yellow River is also called the Wang, I think it's pronounced Wang Ho, that's how they say it, uh, China. Second longest river in the world. I believe it's about 3,400 miles long, something like that. I think the uh, Yangtze is 3,900, so they're relatively similar length. Uh, but the yellow is more important. The yellow uh, is like the mother river of China. It's where, basically where a lot of the Chinese civilization started in China. A lot of their major cities were kind of first built there. It's also like where China started in the um, old Stone Age or Paleolithic Age. Um, I think I remember maybe talking a long time ago about, um, remember I mentioned about Peking Man? It was this like uh, early human fossil that was found in China? Yeah, it was found there, like around where the, close to the Yellow River Basin is. Uh, and I think Peking Man dated to like one million years ago. Like an early, I think it was a Homo erectus uh, human fossil. Uh, and so humans have been living there going back millions of years. They were already there. Uh, East Asia, but they didn't really start farming until probably about six, seven thousand years ago, I think maybe roughly. Now, uh, Chinese culture, uh, uh, of course, looking at this map here of China or the region around China, uh, a lot of its geography is isolated, you know, by different uh, geographic features, uh, which you can see there. Like to the uh, west, uh, you can see. They've got a lot of deserts, like the Tekla-Macon Desert, which is right here. 
uh, and then the Gobi Desert, which is right here. So that's kind of an isolated area, kind of cuts off a lot of people from coming in there. Uh, <clears throat> of course, Tibet and all that down here, they've got a lot of mountains, the Kunlun Mountains, Kilian Mountains, Tibetan Highlands, Himalayas. So all these are different mountain ranges. So very difficult to walk from, say, like if you're in Russia, to go through Mongolia and into India. I actually had people have done that, that have walked that far, which is thousands of miles. It'd take you forever to do it. I've actually had people do it, you know, just crazy. I think it happened. I think I remember reading a story about that in somewhere around World War II. Somebody did it, escaping from like the gulags in, in the Soviet Union. <laughs> but um, it's very isolated, very, very hard. It's more isolated region of China, like over here in the West. And they've got a lot of seas over here, Pacific Ocean, you know, to the east, East China Sea. I think the Sea of Japan's way over here, somewhere to the east of uh, like Korea, Yellow Sea, et cetera, uh, and all that. So all that's kind of helps to isolate China and prevent people from really coming in. <clears throat> Uh, crops wise, uh, I think that was something else. Um, I think I mentioned um, about China. Uh, I, I guess I'll mention that right now. But so yeah, China was pretty much an agricultural society uh, overall. Uh, the main crops they grew a long time ago was chiefly millet, which is a type of type of grain that is mostly grown in arid conditions, and then also later rice, which you know rice became the big staple crop. Of, of Asia and still is today. All those countries in Vietnam, Korea, Japan, you know, so on, all pretty much <clears throat> rice is one of their main staple crops that they eat pretty much with, with their food as a whole. They have other crops now, but I'm just saying those are the main ones that they, long time ago that they first grew uh, originally. <clears throat> and um, so China, China will eventually become come out of isolation, you know, it's isolated at least up to the, I guess, the Qin dynasty, like they were saying, but by the Han dynasty, it starts to kind of become more of a, a, a civilization that's more open to the world and even trades with Europe, like with the Roman Empire in the future. Oh, yeah, I was just previously talking about some of those stats, if you want to know about it, but the, there's the, there's the, um, Links of those rivers. So Yellow River, yeah, 3,400 miles long. And the Yangtze, which is south of the Yellow River, it's about 3,900 miles. So roughly those two are the two longest, of course, in Asia. Of course, I need to talk about like why it's called Yellow River, which is something very interesting uh, about the river. It has a lot to do with the color of the river. I think I've got some slides on that. If you want to look at it. Uh, but it's because of a type of um, soil or silt that's in the actual um, water, which has kind of a yellowish, brownish soil, which is pronounced less. Like, just don't use the O. Just, just take it out. It's silent. But it's usually pronounced less. Uh, and um, I think it's erodes from, like, the mountains and gets into the river basin. It has kind of this um, yellowish brownish color uh, and it, I guess it's kind of used as like a silt to fertilize their crops uh, and all that and um, I think it has like um, what was the stuff in it it's got calcium carbonate in it supposedly uh, which is like a type of rock or it comes some type it's a type of mineral from rocks uh, that erodes down into uh, the water and um, <clears throat> Then, of course, there's another the story they have, of course, about the um, Yellow River is that it does have a nickname. They call it sometimes in modern times, China's Sorrow. Also has another nickname, too, Scourge of the Sons of Han. They call it that, too, <laughs> as well. And uh, a lot of it's due to um, uh, really bad floods that they've had in modern times, which have killed a lot of people in China. Uh, there was two big floods I know they had, one in 1887 that killed like somewhere between one to two million people. That's a lot. Uh, and then there was one in uh, 1931 that killed two to four million people. I don't know the exact number. <laughs> That's crazy. 
Uh, and I think that one in 1931, the 1931 flood was the worst natural disaster in human history that killed that many people. So that's why they call it China's sorrow. They, of course, started to dam the river and things like that. You can see this. You can see they even developed terrace farming uh, and use of dikes as well for irrigation along the river. So anyway, just kind of talking about some of the, you know, geography of China uh, and all of that. Oh, yeah, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about China that's well known that I've got on the bottom there. Was of course, about, you know, Chinese inventions and all. That's something that the Chinese, of course, are kind of well known for uh, overall. And, um, yeah, they're known for a lot of different things they've invented uh, over the years. Of course, those are the most famous. I've got like a, a slide on that. I can show you if you want. There's all kinds of things that the Chinese have kind of invented. Uh, but the ones I've got on that banner pretty much are the most, probably most famous, like paper making, you know, is a big thing of uh, the Chinese. Uh, paper making and printing and calligraphy, um, use of ink, uh, those kind of things are kind of well known. Compass, which I think developed later, something that they, of course, created, which I think Marco Polo brought to Europe. Uh, the crossbow was developed in the Iron Age. Uh, of course, gunpowder. That's something that the Chinese are very well known for, you know, gunpowder. Uh, fireworks, um, which came from, of course, the use of gunpowder. I think they may have helped develop types of gunpowder weapons, like different bombs and cannon from that. Uh, silk, of course, they're famous for developing the silkworm. Um, iron plow, you know, uh, porcelain. There's all kinds of things that the Chinese invented. The, the, the noodle, probably the donut. I think, you know, you could probably think of a bunch of things. This one here has got like a bunch. I think if I could just move it like right here, you don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, but uh, those are just different things that they may have invented uh, at one point. So there's a lot of things that the Chinese invented uh, that's, well, no, some of the first developed certain kinds of money, you know, and things like that uh, overall. So I was kind of talking about Chinese inventions. Uh, printing press, yeah, it's something that'll come west too. Like, you know, John Gutenberg develops the printing press in, in Europe and was kind of influenced by the Chinese, you know, to, of course, develop that. All right, uh, of course, I'm going to move on, of course, next to talk about China's dynasties, which, you know, China's, of course, known for having numerous dynasties over a long period of time. Uh, we're talking like, I think like 3,600 years or more that uh, China's had dynasties uh, at one point. It's kind of like a dynastic cycle of dynasties that have come and gone uh, over, over many years, uh, which uh, the Chinese, by the way, had more dynasties um, I think, you know, years long, I guess, more than uh, Egypt. Egypt had like 3,000 years, I think, worth of dynasties. There's a little longer. In fact, the last emperor of China stepped down in 1912, just recently, 108 years ago. So it's just recently that the, you know, Chinese still had emperors uh, reigning over, of course, their empire. Uh, the Chinese did believe in this political theory you may have heard of. It's called Mandate of Heaven. Probably heard of it, may have looked it up before. Uh, the Chinese uh, name is uh, Tian Ming, which actually in Chinese means heaven's will. And uh, it's a type of political theory which has been sometimes compared to, you ever heard of Divine Right of Kings? It's like a um, European political theory about kings ruling because of God, put them in power. Well, they thought the same thing, that the gods put them in power. Uh, however, the belief was that uh, it was because of the approval of God, that the God is ruling justly, he's a good ruler, and so the God will keep him in power, like a long time, in the dynasty a long time. Uh, however, if they're an unjust ruler, a bad ruler, that meant that God can replace them with one that will, you know, uphold whatever laws, etc. And so that's basically what, what the mandate of heaven is. And it was later developed by this dynasty called the Cho, Cho dynasty. You see there, you know, the Cho dynasty developed it 
because they were replacing this other dynasty and they were kind of trying to come up with, you know, why that other dynasty wasn't any good. <laughs> and so that's why they developed it. So, hey, you're not keeping up the mandate of heaven, you know, the will of heaven or whatever. And so you got replaced, that kind of thing. Uh, the first two major uh, dynasties um, rule a long time, like like almost like 2,000 years, not quite, but almost, uh, which are the Shang and the Cho dynasty. Now, they rule, I had debates on when it is. I think it's 17th or 16th century when they started B.C. And I think the Cho is around till like close to the third century. So, yeah, they're, they're around good, good, good bit, long, long time. Um, they think there were dynasties before that. There may have been one before it. I think it was called the Zia dynasty, XIA, but they're not sure much about it. So they may have had dynasties that went back to maybe before 2000 BC. They may have had kings ruling over China, but there's not much known about it originally. Of course, the one we're going to talk about first today uh, is the Shang dynasty. Um, like this one here. This That's about when they ruled, from about the 16th century to about the 11th century BC. So it is the, uh, you know, the first major dynasty uh, that the Chinese uh, do have. And um, so, yeah, they are the first major China, first major dynasty of China. Uh, and uh, yeah, they ruled from the Yellow River Basin uh, and it's called different names. Shang is the later name. Uh, the dynasties were originally called by them, it was called Yin, uh, Y-I-N. And Yin was supposedly the name of their city or capital that they ruled from, which was located around the Yellow River Basin. Uh, and um, But it had another name they call it, which is uh, the modern name, which is Anyang, A-N-Y-A-N-G, uh, which is actually a modern city. Uh, in China today, uh, China's had a multiple capitals, like at least, I think it's at least four or five major capitals they've had uh, throughout their history. But that was considered the most ancient or oldest uh, capital that originally ruled over China. The capital, the city now, not a capital anymore, Beijing is now, the capital, the city now, it has like 5 million people living there. <laughs> That's a lot of people, you know, for like a smaller city, I guess. Uh, but um, that's a small city in China, I guess. You know, China's got a lot of people. It's 1.3 or 1.4 billion uh, that live in China now. Uh, and um, the, Shang, the Shang, one of the things we'll get into, of course, about the Shang, which, of course, is very well known. The Shang was one of the first uh, that would develop language. Well, there's some more information, of course, about China. So you can see they, were, they existed in northern China. They did have a lot of rulers that ruled over China uh, at one point. Um, and um, they are one of the first to have written records to write things down and have like uh, what we call like early Chinese language. Uh, and starting in like the 18, I think it's 1890s, they started finding these things in China called oracle bones. Uh, that were buried. I forget how many they had. I think they had like 50, that says 150, but I think at first they found like 30 to 50,000 of them. But since then, they've probably found, it might be that many, 150,000, which have been found in parts of Eastern China as a whole. And um, the Oracle bones uh, were pretty important because uh, from that, uh, the Chinese were able to develop what they call, um, they call it either archaic or old Chinese. That's what they call the original language of China, which used calligraphy uh, to draw symbols, which meant ideas or, or, or objects or words. Uh, and uh, the oracle bones were uh, either made of bones. They could be made like, like, like bones. They could be made of turtle shells. Turtle shells were quite common, commonly used, of course, for it, and they are used primarily for uh, telling prophecy, uh, or what we call divination, which means to tell like the future. Uh, so they are into prophecy and things like that. And a lot of it was done by um, either the kings that did it, 
the Shang kings were somehow involved in a lot of these divination type ceremonies where they had these priests that would do it, which were called, um, they're called Shi, S-H-I or S-H-I-H. And um, I think that what they think they would do, they would write calligraphy on it, like the early language, which was often called Oracle Bone Script. And they would take it and they would sometimes put it over a fire and watch it burn. And like from the burning of the oracle bones, supposedly the uh, priest or the king could see the future or something like that. Now, um, the Shang uh, as a culture, um, they were known for introducing different things to China. Uh, first of all, uh, they were uh, known for, of course, being one of the first to develop bronze. Uh, in China uh, as a whole. Uh, they also were known for their pottery, the famous Shang pottery. Which I think I do got police. I think I've got picture of their, of their pottery, which were sometimes made of different things like bronze. They made pottery out of jade and also made objects out of jade, things like that uh, as a whole. Uh, what else? They, um, Ceramic pottery, you know, and so on. It's something that they're really known for, which is probably very valuable today, like pottery from the Shang period. Like any pottery from ancient China is very valuable, uh, very expensive, or probably in some cases millions of dollars uh, as a whole. Uh, the kings themselves, um, uh, they were all based on hereditary means, so passed down from Followed a son. Um, they weren't exactly absolute, but the kings did have power over like religion. And oftentimes, like I said, uh, they were involved in a lot of these divination ceremonies, which involved the oracle bones. And so it was a big part of their religious beliefs. Uh, they did have different gods, which most of their gods were based on like the natural world, like the sun, the moon, the earth, rain, etc. Uh, but they did have a supreme god, which was often called Di, which in um, Chinese supposedly meant the supreme deity or supreme god, or the sup supreme god in heaven or something like that. So they did have like a supreme god you know, that they, that they worshipped, uh, like some cultures had. Uh, and uh, the Shang, like I said, were around for several hundred years uh, before they were conquered by other people that came in, which that'll be later uh, known as, of course, the so-called Cho dynasty uh, that they uh, have later. I think I've got a slide here, too, on their or on their Shang beliefs, uh, if you want to look at it uh, right here. They supposedly were into ancestor veneration, which I'll talk about later, uh, which is something you see a lot in China, which it maybe probably originated with them. Uh, they believe that giving respect toward the dead or their ancestors would uh, bring about good things, uh, you know, happiness and success in life. And I guess their crops would grow and, you know, and so on. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, so that was just, you know, a little bit about the Shang. Now let me go ahead and move on and also talk about uh, they have this other dynasty uh, that's called the Cho. Some people call it, say it Zo. I think it's usually pronounced Cho, how uh, they say it. Uh, the Cho is one of the longest reigning dynasties uh, in Chinese history. Uh, they, of course, would come in, and the Cho, the Cho conquered the Shang. They were kind of like, I think, considered originally barbarians that were, I think, lived west of where the Shang were, like more toward the western part or central part of the Yellow River Valley. And they moved in sometime in the uh, 1000 range BC, took over took over uh, China. And like I said, they would reign a long time. They were around like close to almost 800 years. I don't know if it was quite 800, but it was almost 800 years uh, that they reigned. And uh, the Cho were known for introducing different things to China. One of the big things they brought in was uh, they were the ones that would introduce eventually iron technology uh, to China. And so because of them, the Iron Age would start uh, in China. I talked about the crossbow originally, too, as a famous invention of the Chinese. People think of like medieval Europe, you know, because they used 
crossbows, but Chinese already had it. Uh, and uh, yeah, they invented the crossbow. The Cho, one of the of course ones that did that uh, as well. They did have a different capital. They would move the capital from uh, Yin or An Yang to another city called Lo Yang, which was also today called Xing Chao. That's the modern modern name, of course, they call it now. Uh, and that became another famous capital of China, uh, which is well known. And uh, it did have a family that founded it. They were called the Ji family, J-I, the Ji family, which ruled over this dynasty for, I think, a few hundred years. And uh, they're the ones that actually developed the mandate of heaven. The Ji family created it uh, as a means to explain why they had seized power uh, over the um, Shang dynasty because uh, they weren't living up to the mandate of the God's will in heaven. And so we replaced them. So <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, now, the one thing about the Cho dynasty, it's divided into two main periods. Uh, that's called the, they call it the Western Cho, and they have the Eastern Cho. And you can see the different periods of it, 11th to the 8th century BC. Uh, the Western Cho is kind of like a Bronze Age period of China. And then the Eastern Cho is like an Iron Age period. So sometime around that, 8th, 7th century, they think, China starts to move from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age at uh, that time. And um, I got too much stuff on them. They've got some information if you want to look later, of course, about uh, the uh, dynasty itself uh, right here. They're going to rule down uh, until the uh, Warring States period, which is kind of famous later uh, in China's the and um, there's some stuff they invented, of course, like the story about the mandate of heaven, which is part of the whole dynastic cycle, which is the rise and fall of dynasties, you know, uh, in China, which China has like over several thousand years uh, that they have um, overall. And uh, yeah, he says that they told the people that the gods had become angry at the Shang. And so <laughs> that's why they chose us, because they weren't they were kind of cruel. And that's why we ended up in power you know, and all that. So um, now um, there's different periods. One thing about uh, the Cho period, which is very interesting, that's kind of different uh, that I sometimes talk about is that the, at the, uh, when the Cho started declining, like near the end of the Western Cho period, there's a actually a feudal period that comes into China, which is very similar to medieval Europe. In fact, China goes through that kind of same period. Uh, they call it the Fang Jin or Fang Jing. Uh, and uh, it's a period where what happened was the kings of the Cho dynasty became weak. They became like figureheads. And you had all these uh, warlords that kind of took over China. And they started dividing China into these different vassal states. Uh, and um, what happened was it led to a social structure where he had lords at the top and they had vassals under them and they had peasants on the bottom, which were kind of like serfs, like in medieval Europe. Serfs are kind of like peasants that are bound to the land. And uh, what happened was they took all the land and they divided it up. Uh, and uh, the Chinese developed this um, land distribution system that was called the well field system. It divided land into nine parts. Uh, eight parts were like private land, and they had one part that was public land. Uh, and uh, the eight parts were basically land where the peasants would work their land for themselves. And they had a, knife, a ninth part of the land where they would work that for the actual lord. And they would give the crop to him as like a form of tribute, basically. So they did the same thing in medieval Europe. You know, where you had these peasants, whatever, working the land, they'd give part of the crop to the Lord as like a form of tribute uh, in feudalism. And so, yeah, it's very comparable, you know, to, to both sides. And China went through this series, this period, like a few hundred years where they went through a feudal period. And it kind of comes through it down to a period that's called the, um, you may have heard of it, called the spring and autumn period that they dub it. Uh, and I think it goes down maybe into like the period of the warring states. Uh, and all of that. 
And that's a different period. Like the period of the, uh, it's called the spring and autumn period is, is, is a period in China that occurs between the eighth to the fifth centuries BC. It's about two, 300 year period. It occurs under the Eastern Cho. Uh, the Cho got attacked by these nomads in the West, like in the Western central part of China. And so they moved their capital to the East, like the more Eastern part of China, uh, basically, which is why they call it Eastern Cho. And uh, the Cho began declining with these feudal states, you know, gaining all this power. And then what's going to happen over time, which I'll get to later, China is going to break up into these rival kingdoms or states that start fighting each other. And it's later called the period of the warring states or warring states period. It goes down to about the third century BC. So China is going to start, you know, breaking up into the, all these different states. Now, I won't talk about it now, but China will later be, like you just saw the video there, you can watch later if you want again, but uh, China is going to eventually be um, formed into like an empire under the uh, Qin or Qin dynasty, which will take over China. Now, in the spring and autumn period, there was a uh, period I want to talk about that's kind of important. That was called the Hundred Schools of Thought. So that came about uh, in China at the time. It was a period where China went through a time time where they started experimenting with different types of philosophy in different schools of thought uh, throughout China. So that's why they caught that. So it starts sometime around the sixth century, they think, and goes down to close to where the Warring States period, I think, begins. And it was mostly a period that was founded by various Chinese philosophers like Confucius, you may have heard of, Sun Tzu and others. You've probably heard those names on uh, various scholars uh, that were in China uh, at the time. I think I do have some slides later if you want to look at later more on, on some of the stuff we talked about. So that's more stuff on the uh, Cho dynasty if you want to look at it later. Uh, in the PowerPoint. It does have the, they think the dates of the spring and autumn period is usually about right here, 771, 481, which is under the Eastern Cho, uh, when it's pretty much just declining and the king doesn't have any power. He's just a figurehead. And you can see the Warring States period kind of comes on the heels of that, 481 to about 221 BC. So, you can see on the bottom there, those, uh, of course, uh, and I do have a map, too, if you want to look later. I'll show the map later when I get more into the Warring States period. But that's that's basically uh, what it looks like later China before it starts unifying into an empire. But, yeah, you got all these different Chinese schools of thought that kind of emerge the spring and autumn period. Those are like the three big ones. They had Confucianism, Taoism, legalism. So initially those are the ones – that are considered the most important uh, overall. Uh, and um, there's also other ones too, I guess I might mention too. So those are the three right there you're looking at. Also the school of yin and yang, which you may have heard of, uh, which was this concept of like dualism and nature in the universe. Uh, the idea that there's two, op two polar opposites, you know, good versus evil, black and white, male and female hot and cold, you know, et cetera. And that's a big thing that's part of <clears throat> like um, influencing Taoism or Taoism is heavily, of course, influenced by that. I think Confucian was a little bit, maybe, but not so much uh, overall. So I'll briefly talk about legalism, but legalism was something that was developed later under the um, Qin dynasty, which came later after this period. Uh, of course, the most famous, you know, Chinese philosophical system that they've got in China is, of course, Confucianism, uh, which, you know, uh, there, of course, a little slide right there, of course, Confucius. Uh, and um, Confucian is, Confucianism is, um, it's kind of considered a religion, but it's more of a philosophical system uh, based on morals and ethics. They kind of see it as a religion, but um, it's um, more like secular. It's not really, you know, like a religion as much, but more of a way of life in a way of like following certain virtues, morals, ethics, uh, et cetera. 
And uh, Confucius, uh, who founded it, lived uh, like 2,500 years ago. So he lived like they think between the 6th and 5th centuries is about right. Uh, they think he was a philosopher, but also some kind of politician uh, that may have been like either a priest or maybe like almost like a minister uh, to one of the kings uh, at that time in China. Uh, and uh, Confucius is a Western name. It's a name that the, um, I think it was the Catholics that developed it, like Catholic Jesuits a long time ago in the 1500s called him Confucius from his Chinese name, which is, I think it's pronounced different ways. Some people say Kung Fu Si or Kung Fu Su, uh, something like that. But they called him Master Kong. Well, that was what they, they dubbed him. And then in the 1500s, they kind of slurred the name, I think is what happened, Westerners, and it became known as Confucius, uh, basically. Uh, Confucius believed in different philosophical ideas. Uh, there was one idea to kind of so sometimes talk about, which is called, um, they either call it the five Confucian relationships or the five bonds. Confucius believed that um, society could be better if there was social harmony between people, you know, that are related to each other or friends, or et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, you didn't want the sister marrying the brother and you know, stuff like that, I guess, is probably part of why they developed it uh, and so on. But it, it created better social order, uh, less anarchy. Uh, and so, um, of course, these are very famous, uh, the five Confucian relationships, which a lot of people call it, I think, in Asia, the five bonds. And uh, these are the five typically. Uh, usually, of course, the, the highest one is, of course, considered to be between the ruler and the subject. So the ruler should treat the subject a certain way. Usually the one on the, that's to the right is the one that should be subservient. So the subject should be subservient to the ruler, uh, pretty much. <clears throat> father the son. So the father treats the son a certain way. The son is subservient to the father. Husband treats the wife a certain way and vice versa. Wife is subservient to the husband. <clears throat> elder brother to the younger brother. Uh, usually the older brother is more respected because uh, he's older. Uh, friend to friend also. And so all these different relationships uh, develop uh, ways that create proper con conduct among each other, which supposedly creates more of social stability, you know, overall. It's still kind of like that in parts of Asia. They still kind of follow these ideas, especially in like Confucianism, Buddhism, etc. Uh, another idea that you see too uh, in um, Confucianism, here's another slide, by the way, if you want to look at it later too, on Confucius, like more information about him. So yeah, it's about all kinds of ways they say. The Kung Fu Si, I think, is another variation of the name um, also as well that you got there. But um, one other thing too, of course, he uh, was famous for, uh, he uh, popularized the idea of filial piety, which has probably been around uh, before uh, Confucius, but that's where you give respect towards your elders, uh, towards your parents. So you can be an elder brother, elder sister, elder parents, your parents, also your ancestors, grandfather, grandmother, you know, et cetera. So these are, like I said, are key virtues you see in a lot of Eastern countries. We see it in China, Japan, Korea, uh, et cetera. Uh, and you see it a lot also in a lot of these philosophical religious systems, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism. That's quite common, uh, filial piety. So to do things like, you know, that, you know, have bad face on your parents, you know, or your family is is often considered really, really a bad thing, you know, insult your family or do bad things. So it's a form of ethics morality, I guess, more or less, that was part of this originally. Uh, then also ancestor veneration, which has been around, you know, going back in China, going back to the Shang Dynasty, probably, like I said, veneration of the dead, you know, love and respect towards the dead, your deceased ancestors, your grandpa has been dead a while, you know, that kind of things. Sometimes you can see it further back than that, where it's like hundreds of years back, you know, that they're giving respect 
uh, toward the debt. So those are some things that Confucius introduced. Uh, of course, in that slide there, you can see there's a few things there that he also believed government jobs should be open to all people, not just the nobility. That's something he kind of came up with. And um, Confucius um, is one of the first to force the state or states to uh, introduce civil service examinations uh, to get jobs like in the government and stuff like that. And that's something you see later they pretty much do. So, you know, work hard to make the world better. That's good too. Uh, of course, the um, <clears throat> other thing that Confucius is known for is his golden rule. That was considered one of his most famous philosophical teachings that he had. And it's a principle of treating others on how you want to be treated. Now, there's all kinds of different translations of, of the golden rule. It's, there's even like, you know, Christian versions of it, you know, and all that. Um, like this one says, do not treat others in the ways that you would not like to be treated or do not impose on others what you do not wish for yourself. So there's all kinds of versions of it. I think there's a golden rule and silver rule, which are kind of similar uh, to each other. But it's one of the most um, you know, famous sayings and it's shown up everywhere in pretty much Eastern, Western thought, you know, overall. Uh, Confucius, uh, what happened was over time, like I said, he was, you know, lived around the 6th, 5th century. Over time, his writings and sayings were compiled together, which took a few hundred years. Uh, they think by the time of the period of the Warring States, they compiled it into like one book, and it became either known as the Analects or the Analects of Confucius. So, you know, I think it is revised over time. I think by the time the Jesuits got got into China, they revised it even more and um, began translating it too. I think the Jesuits were the first to translate into like Latin and other languages, uh, stuff like that. And they start doing that. So it's, it's something that took a long time to kind of revolve, evolve over time, uh, the philosophy of Confucius. Uh, there are some other uh, Chinese philosophy I did want to mention about besides, you know, Confucius. If you want to go back and look at some of this, there's some more stuff about the five basic relationships. Uh, if you want to take a look at that uh, as well, here's some more critical ideas uh, too. You can see the ideas spread all over the place. Korea, Japan, Vietnam uh, are some other areas that it eventually, you know, moves into. Uh, so there's a lot of emphasis on the family, family values, education. Uh, so all these are kind of important uh, in Confucianism in similar types of uh, cultural settings. Uh, they also have Taoism or Taoism. I don't know if you ever heard of that one, uh, but it's a kind of a rival Chinese philosophy that came about uh, around the same time as Confucius lived. Uh, and um, got a little slide I'll put up here for you, but basically, yeah, it developed about fifth, sixth century BC, roughly. And it's a type of philosophical system of China in China that lived, that emphasized living in harmony with what they call the Tao or Tao, which uh, was a term meaning the way, which a uh, way meant either like a ro road or a path that one would follow uh, like in life. It kind of sounds like something the Buddhists developed as well. And uh, the Taoists, uh, you can see there, heavily believed in the yin and the yang. That's actually a big part of the school of thought. Uh, that goes with Taoism or Taoism. Uh, and uh, it's this, like I said, this idea of cosmic dualism uh, in the universe or in nature uh, where there's polar opposites, good versus evil, um, cold versus hot, male versus female. Uh, and it's usually symbolized with that black and white symbol uh, you see up there. And it did have a founder. They had a founder named Lao Tzu, uh, who they sometimes call old master, uh, who they think was around the same time as Confucius was. Uh, and um, he developed a book um, of sayings, like kind of like Confucius had, uh, which was called the Book of the Way, or also called Teo Te Ching. Uh, and that book became the basis of that philosophy system um, and still is today. So, yeah, and of course, here's a definition of what Tao is. Tao is the natural order of the universe whose character 
one's human in intuition must discern in order to realize the potential for individual wisdom. Kind of a long definition, but that's kind of a good definition. Of, but, but it has something to do with the natural order of the universe and being in harmony with it. Uh, and um, it's different from Confucianism, uh, definitely for sure. So it's not quite the same. They're kind of parallel type philosophical systems, but I think the yin and the yang is something that kind of makes it, I think, different a little bit from Confucianism. I don't have a slide on that one, but like a like a you know PowerPoint slide, but uh, they also have later what they call legalism. I think I talk about it later under uh, the, the Qin or Qin dynasty, but that's another type of Chinese philosophical system that was very popular uh, that they developed, which emphasized um, this idea of a powerful centralized type government where instead of like these feudal lords having power, uh, power was more in the hands of these uh, emperors that would control China uh, as an imperial type dynasty. Uh, and that's something you see a lot, uh, of course, in China later, uh, but it gets merged with other ideas like Confucianism, Taoism, uh, as well, uh, although early on it wasn't very nice to Confucianism, uh, like in that little short video, <laughs> they actually tried to prevent the spread of Confucianism for a while, uh, which is funny. Oh, one more thing I did want to mention about who's around the same time period. You probably heard of Sun Tzu. He was a famous Chinese general. Uh, he lived close to the fifth century BC, kind of like close to the beginning of the uh, Warring States period, and. Um, he was a famous military strategist who wrote that book you've heard of called The Art of War. So that's a, also another thing that kind of happened during the so-called, you know, 100 schools of thought. You got these new ideas of military theories coming out. And his book, The Art of War, influenced a lot of people you know, with military strategy and war. So a lot of people have used that book. I think in business today, they even kind of adopted it as well. So of running business and so on. So anyway, that's pretty much it for lecture on, uh, well, later, not now, but we're going to talk about later the period of the warring states. I'm going to get more into that later. Uh, China's, of course, had broken up, and it's going to, of course, get back together uh, and, of course, form an empire under the so-called uh, Qin or Qin, Qin dynasty. We'll talk about them later because uh, they're going to form the Chinese empire at the end of the third century BC. That'll be my lecture on Wednesday when I get more into the Chinese empire. And I'll talk about that dynasty and the Han dynasty that's gonna follow it. All right, let me, uh, I guess, quickly review a little bit. Uh, that's gonna be it for today. I'll kind of go through some of the main stuff that we covered today, uh, of course, in class. So it says around what major river did the ancient China develop its early civilization? I told you the Yellow River, which is around 33 or 3,400 miles long, second longest river in Asia. So we talked about that one first uh, originally. Uh, what geographic features helped to isolate China as a culture? They were, uh, they were isolated by mountain ranges, like to the west. You've got all these mountains like the Tibetan highlands and Himalayas, the Kunlun Mountains, uh, et cetera. You've got the Taklamakan Desert, the Gobi Desert. So all that kind of isolated China. Uh, into the east, you've got like um, you've got uh, like the Yellow Sea and East China Sea, Pacific Ocean. So all that isolates China and prevents people from really getting in there. Uh, what crops were mainly grown in ancient China? I told you millet originally, and then also rice came in later. Uh, how did the Yellow River get its name? Uh, it came from this um, yellowish, brownish silt deposits, like soil deposits that are called less that get in the river. And it kind of gives it a yellowish, brownish color. It's also called the Wang Ho, of course, in Chinese. Uh, what is the nickname of the Yellow River? Why is it called that? It's called Yellow River. Well, what is the, the they're talking about the modern nickname of it is what it really should be. Uh, they call it China's sorrow due to all the massive floods uh, that have killed people in China uh, over the years. Like the worst one I told you, I think, was in um, 1931, which killed like three or four million people. 
Uh, what are some inventions, technologies that Chinese are famous for? I'll tell you a bunch of these. Uh, the compass, uh, silk, um, gunpowder, uh, porcelain. Uh, they developed printing, paper, um, crossbow. Um, I think that's the big ones I think I talked about. Uh, ink. Um, so they were known for all kinds of inventions uh, that changed the world. Uh, overall, probably printing press, you know, and gunpowder, probably the probably two biggest ones, and maybe even the compass. You want to talk about exploration later. Uh, dynastic cycles is the cycle of like decline and fall of dynasties, which, you know, China was kind of known for a lot, like 3,600 years of dynasties. And I told you that the political theory that was often um, something they invented was called the Mandate of Heaven or Tian Ming. Uh, which the Cho dynasty developed on why dynasties rise and fall because of, you know, what God, what God um, thinks of good versus bad dynasties. So basically the will of heaven is what dictates who rules a dynasty or for kings. Uh, first major dynasty, of course, was the Shang dynasty, and they developed around a city called Yin, which the modern city is now called Anyang. Uh, what were oracle bones? Oracle bones were uh, these bones or turtle shells uh, that the Chinese used to develop early writing systems, uh, which we call either oracle, we either called it, well, they call it oracle bone script, but it led to what is um, old Chinese or archaic Chinese, same thing, which is like the first language they had in China. Uh, they were mostly used oracle bones for um, divination or prophecy, where kings or priests would use them to tell the future. And so from that, language developed uh, over time, and they developed the first calligraphy writing of their language. Uh, what second dynasty conquered Shang? Uh, that was the Chou dynasty, or Zhou and the Cho were the ones that um, introduced iron weapons to China, which led to the Iron Age. Uh, they brought in like the crossbow. Uh, and I told you the Cho were the ones that developed the mandate of heaven, uh, political theory on why their dynasty and others later ruled. Uh, what was the feudal period of China? That was a period in China uh, where uh, China broke up into these... Um, uh, vassal states ruled by warlords, uh, and it developed a system similar to medieval Europe, where they had a social order of lords, vassals, and peasants. And I told you that in China, they developed the, what they call the well field system, where the peasants and the lords shared land, and they had to give crops to the lord as a form of tribute. Uh, what happened after the Cho declined uh, during the Eastern Cho? Eastern Cho, uh, they call it the spring and autumn period. And uh, the Cho broke up into these like um, competing um, vassal states ruled by lords. And it led to the um, period of the warring states uh, that would come later. Uh, during what Chinese historical period did the hundred schools of thought begin? That was the spring and autumn period, uh, which would be also at the end of the Cho period, which is the Eastern Cho. Uh, and uh, that was a period in China where uh, different philo philosophical schools and um, philosophers emerged uh, to develop Chinese philosophy. Examples were Confucianism, they had Taoism, legalism were the big ones. Also, I told you about the school of yin and yang, which was later kind of adopted and also Taoism. Uh, who was Confucius? Confucius was the greatest Chinese philosopher. He was a Chinese politician and is considered the founder of Confucianism, which developed about 2,500 years ago. Uh, what are some ideas he taught? Uh, told you he taught the idea of the five bonds or the five Confucian relationships, which he thought could better uh, Chinese society between relatives and other people to create create order, you know, in society. 
Uh, filial piety was an idea he, he brought about because the idea where you would give respect towards your elders, your parents, the dead. And an ancestor veneration is the belief in giving respect toward the dead, honoring the dead, uh, which is still done in the West, too. Uh, like you've got All Saints Day coming up November 1st after Halloween, and that's a good example of kind of like ancestor veneration. Um, what is the golden rule? Uh, it was a type of teaching that Confucius taught, which is basically treat people how you want to be treated, uh, which I've told you there's different versions of it, but do not impose on others what you do not wish for yourself, I think is one version of it. Uh, this will get later, but um, we're gonna, not going to talk about these now, but we'll talk about the period. That's the period of the Warring States. That's, that's that period between the 5th and 3rd centuries where China breaks up into competing warring states. Then I'll get to the Qin dynasty or Qin dynasty. They're going to eventually come in and just basically conquer China and form the empire. So a lot of these slides I'm going to, I think that's a repeat slide, which I can take out later. But uh, that's the bulk of the review material, of course, for that section we've covered today. So that's pretty much it uh, lecture-wise uh, today on ancient China. Uh, of course, on Wednesday, I will be uh, moving on uh, to talk about uh, the rest of China, I'll kind of talk, about, like I said, about the Qin, Qin, Qin dynasty that's going to come in. He, that, that guy's ruthless, too, like I said in the video. We'll, we'll talk about him, uh, the guy that built the Great Wall of China. I am going to have a little short video, uh, actually two videos. I'll have one, of course, I'll show you uh, later on the Terracotta Army, which that guy Qin Shi Huangdi developed, of course. And I will have an assignment coming up, too, that's going to be uh, on the um, Great Wall of China, um, which I'll post this week. So just watch for that. I'll probably have an announcement on that coming up. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions, of course, about this lecture today uh, overall. Um, I'll, I'll be, of course, posting this lecture to my YouTube channel uh, afterwards. So, yeah, please send me comments, questions. I guess nobody has any questions since nobody put anything up uh, while I was lecturing. Uh, but like when I'm lecturing, you can put up questions or comments and I can try to answer them real quick uh, on all that before we go. So that's it for today. Uh, I will check. I'll see y'all later. I guess watch the weather because it's like, you know, we might have a hurricane coming. Uh, so it could affect our schedule later in the week, Thursday or Friday. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but it probably won't affect us uh, for Monday and Wednesdays. So I will see y'all uh, later uh, on Wednesday. Hope y'all have a nice day and the rest of the week on uh, take care. And so that's it. So y'all take care. Yeah. So see you later.